Okay, what about the that would the Florida Panther um, story would be something that we would model after for the Iranian cheetah, perhaps, or some of the other West African populations, if indeed they um, there is interest in bringing those populations back at some point, or even trying to maintain the Iranian cheetah population if it is so small. What, from what you've seen with the Iranian cheetah compared to that of the East or the Namibian, um, if indeed it was necessary, it could be genetically done. Yeah. <clears throat> the Iranian cheetah is a special issue. It's particularly exciting to understand the history of the Iranian cheetah because of what we know about the African cheetah, which is that it is clearly the descendant of a very recent population bottleneck where all the genetic diversity in the African cheetahs is, uh, goes back to about 12,000 years ago. The Iranian cheetah is on a different continent, and usually when species are on different continents, the genetic distance between them coalesces to a much older time. For example, leopards in Africa and in Asia go back 150 to 200,000 years ago. That's how much diversity has occurred between them. The same thing is true between the pumas of North America and South America. The same thing is true uh, between uh, some of the some of the continental subspecies of tigers, such as the Sumatran su uh, uh, subspecies versus the Bengal. So, is the Iranian cheetah really a continental difference? Did it exist before the bottleneck and? pretty much has diversity. We don't know the answer to that yet, so that's one thing we have to determine. We have to look more carefully at the Iranian cheetah compared to the African cheetah and find out whether or not it really is a relic subspecies of cheetah that preceded the population bottleneck, or whether it was reintroduced in the Middle East from an African founder event after the population bottleneck. And the genetics will tell us the answer to that. Let's suppose that it is the second. It was reintroduced. And let's suppose that it's a small population of less than 30 or 40 animals. Well, if we actually were able to quantify clinical correlates of inbreeding, that is, not all bottlenecks cause medical problems. Some do, some are worse than others. But if, in fact, you have a, a study that shows that the Iranian cheetah is suffering correlates of inbreeding, reproductive problems, congenital abnormalities, and things that we look for in inbred populations. Then I think you're going to be in the same kind of decision-making mode that we were with the Florida panther, which is, yeah, it might be a good idea to introduce some African animals into there, particularly if they've known to have been founded from African animals more recently. Um, I hope to know the answer to that soon because thanks to you, Lori, and some of your colleagues, we've been able to obtain some materials from the Iranian cheetahs, and we're looking at them carefully. We don't have the data yet, though. Tell me um, a little bit about, you've talked about this before, the number of genes overall, and then what it looks like the number of genes today for the cheetah. I mean, you, I think it was like 300,000 gene pairs that animals have, and that the cheetah's down to like 30,000. For some reason, I, you told me this a while back, and, I, and I'd like to hear yeah, that. Yeah, um, the original measurements of cheetah diversity were done with samples of genes, such as allozymes or two-dimensional gels or major histocompatibility complex. But, now that we're in the 21st century, we actually know a lot more about the genomes of species. That is the entire genetic complement. We know that there's about 20,000 genes in the human genome, in the mouse genome, in the dog genome, and in the cat genome, and in the cheetah's genome. And those 20,000 genes are part of a genome that is found in every, every individual, but the total length of the base pairs is about 2.8 billion base pairs. That's how many nucleotide letters there are altogether. And in every um, every uh, human being, there is a base letter difference called a single nucleotide polymorphism about every thousand base pairs. That translates to on the order of around 10 to 12 million genetic differences between 
myself and my wife, or between any two people who you might want to compare. Ten million differences, okay? Well, when we look at cheetahs, the amount is varying, but it's probably down to between 100,000 and 500,000 genetic differences between individual cheetahs instead of 10 million. So there's been 90% reduction, maybe even a 95% reduction. It depends on which gene you look at. But basically, the reduction is, is remarkable, and it's seen when you randomly sequence DNA segments in cheetahs, which we've gone ahead and done with some of the sequencing centers. So the cheetah's bottleneck, discovered 20 years ago with the tools of that day, has been replicated and reinforced and, and, and has been seen over and over, over across the last two decades. And what it means is that cheetah's just has a smaller set of variation to deal with. Is that bad? Well, it, it, it usually isn't very good, but because the cheetah has grown up from a, a bottleneck something like 12,000 years ago, it's probably gone through two or 3,000 generations, risen up to several hundred thousand individuals. So it's not rate limiting. So the cheetah's story, in some way, can be considered a success story. One that it's overcome this, this near extinction event, been handed this uh, deck of cards to play, which is its, its genetic equivalent, and one of the most successful predators that evolution ever created has prevailed.